chapter number eight tonight, and uh, we're going to talk about no condemnation. Amen. No condemnation. We we scratched the surface this morning on just a couple of things, and my apology that it was not well presented because I feel like it's way deeper than what I could ever convey to you. Uh, this truth that we have been set free and how it happens on the, on, on literally on the back of our Savior to me is just indescribable. Um, and and uh, this, can, can I go over a couple things with you? I want you to know that at the center of everything God's ever intended to do throughout all eternity from eternity past to eternity future, and since the time that man has been on this planet till the last moment he draws air in this universe, there's one central focus, and it is the cross of Calvary. Amen. It is the idea that God has always intended that He would be our deliverer. He, he set us into this place of being um, uh, worshipers and, and to be able to be part of His wonderful family. And we lost that privilege through sin. And, but, but that's no surprise to God because He knew it ahead of time. And He had already made a plan before the, the world was ever formed. He had made a plan that He could redeem fallen man by whosoever will would come into this plan and come underneath the umbrella of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing plan. The reason that thing is so well um, constructed is because at the base of the cross, it don't matter who you are, the ground is level. There's no big I's and little U's, amen? There's no folks that are coming in more uh, worthy than anybody else. Everybody comes in at the same status, and that is sinners needing the Savior. Everybody. Amen. Uh, there's nothing else I know of that's like that. Uh, the economic society that we got set up, the social network that's made, nothing that I know of is set up with that kind of equality where everybody is treated exactly the same. When we, whenever he says that God is no respecter of persons, I think we kind of just blow that off like that's some kind of a minor statement. That is huge. We're talking about everybody absolutely alike. Even the Jew doesn't have a preference over the Gentile. The preacher doesn't have a preference over the sound operator or the guitar string terror upper. <laughs> did, did, I know I pick on people bad. I, I apologize. You got... No, I don't. I do enjoy. That's the one perk I get. I do enjoy that. But I do. I, I want. But the, the idea that we have this equality in Christ. There, not only the equality of when we come in, we're all the same, but the same opportunity to advance to whatever. Do you know that he chose fishermen? To preach the gospel, he didn't go to the local seminary. He, he didn't go to the synagogue and said, I need your best students. He picked them right out of everyday common laboring men and women to go out and tell the story. Hallelujah. He pulled them out of the same cesspools that you and I flounder in all the time. Thank God. Man, if he can use somebody like Mary Magdalene, he will use you and me. No condemnation. We did verse 1 this morning slightly. If I go back to verse 1, we'll never make verse 2. So I want to move on if I can. I told you there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When I saw that first word in verse number two, that word fall, uh, four, it tells us the idea here that we're looking at is this is the why there's no condemnation. I mean, to, to just say there's no condemnation doesn't make condemnation go away. 
I can tell you all people don't blame you, Frank, but they could be blaming you. Um, you, nobody can point a finger at you, Ray, but they may be pointing fingers. But, there's, but for Paul the Apostle to say there's now no condemnation, he goes on to say, let me tell you why. And he says, here it is. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Yeah. Set me free. From the law of sin and death. In other words, this law has no dominion over me no more because I find a new law. The new law is if I put my faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I am a brand new creature. All things pass away and all things become new. It's a remarkable thing. No condemnation. The reason why is because the law of sin and death has been passed away from me. Now, I told you and I tell you all the time that sin cannot just be forgiven. It's got to be paid for. So the law of sin and death, where was that met? At the cross. At the cross of Calvary by a man that you and I know of as Jesus of Nazareth. All of the sin of all the world, your sin, your sin, and your sin, and, your, and mine, and everybody that's ever lived, ever will live, were placed on, G not on the cross, they were placed on the man that hung on that cross. Right, amen. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. Oh my goodness. God, you know what I talk to you all the time about imputation? It's the idea that you can assign something to somebody. And God assigned your sin, your guiltiness, to the only one that's ever lived who was guiltless, Jesus Christ. That don't sound very fair, does it? We trade to him our guiltiness. We receive back in that trade his righteousness. He's holy. We're anything but holy. But just by imputation, by faith and believing, God enacts a thing known as grace and mercy, and he makes an exchange through imputation and assigns our sins to the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God that he always knew would one day come and pay the sin of the entire world, and he assigns the righteousness of that lamb, the spotlessness of that lamb, to everyone who will come in faith believe it. That's the law of spirit and life that he's talking about here. The law of spirit and life, it takes uh, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and listen, it has made me free from the law of sin. It's taken away the condemnation. That's why I can stand here before you today and be as if there is no sin in my life whatsoever, because Jesus has made me free. Amen. It's an amazing concept. I'm, I'm so grateful for this uh, doctrine today. I want you to look at verse number three. He goes on to say, here's another why. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, actually in his flesh. That's what happened. Verse 4 follows, remember it's still going in the same sentence, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I got to remind you that these verses, even though they're talking about no condemnation, we'll keep seeing over and over and over again the, um, the exhortation that we're to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. I want to remind you of that. You're looking at verse number four. There was a statement that kind of um, stuck out to me. It's that statement that says in verse four that the righteousness of the law. I saw, thought to myself, what in the world, what kind of righteousness is there in a law that always points condemnation out? All the law of Moses ever did was point at people and say, guilty, 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 guilty. Where's the righteousness in that? But what I looked at was I found out that the righteousness of the law is absolute requirement of 100% holiness. 
if you were going to be righteous under the law, you couldn't do nothing. Do you remember that Jesus said that he that breaks one is guilty of breaking it all? I mean, if you told one little, you know, you, you've ever been there, there's white lies and black lies, right? Have you ever told one little white lie? If you ever poked fun at somebody like Jason, you would be under condemnation of the entire law because you broke the smallest tittle of the law. So the law is absolute 100% holiness. That's what the requirement is. And it says here that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Notice it didn't say that the righteousness of the law be fulfilled in Jesus, that it would be fulfilled in us. Everybody knows he was righteous. He was holy. He was sinless. Everybody's okay with that. Nobody argues that point. But how can we say that we are? Only by this simple process of imputation. The idea that by grace through faith and Jesus paying the price for us, that law of holiness and righteousness gets fulfilled in you and I when we walk after this new life in the Spirit of God. I told you this morning, you tried and you tried and you tried and you couldn't change who you were. Let me tell you something else I might not have even told you this morning. You might have changed some of the stuff you were doing, even some of the places you were going, and some of the people you were hanging around. I remember many, many decades ago when I started talking about stuff like this, I was, um, I was still working and I had a client who was big into the AA program. And whenever I discussed this stuff, well, he said, well, we do that. I said, well, you do what? He said, you got, we say you got to change your playground, your playmates, and your playthings. I said, okay. And you might have been through some type of a process where you even tried that. You left the old friends behind because they was guiding you into sin. Or maybe you quit going to some of the places that you kept getting in trouble in. Or maybe you quit doing some of the things that you used to do. But the problem was you didn't change the essential issue of you're the, still the same old person. My daddy used to say it like this. You can go out to the hog pen and get a hog and bring him in, put him in the bathtub. You can wash him up with ivory soap, 99.99% pure. You can, you can powder him down. You can put a bow on him. You can blow dry him. You can put a lipstick on him if you want to. He said, but you let that hog out of the house, and you know where he'll go? It's the nature of the hog. You might have changed his environment. You might have changed his, the way he smelled, the way he looked. You might have changed, took him away from the other hogs. Certainly he's going to change now. Isn't he better? And the answer is no. We find here that the only hope for an individual to be able to walk after spiritual things instead of carnal things is that you must now be transformed. You must be forgiven of who you are and you must have the indwelling Spirit of God so that you can learn to walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. Those terms mean stuff that you got your heart and your mindset to. Look, look at verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. When I look that up, uh, that mind the things of the flesh, it, it means to set your affections on them or actually to have obedience to the things. So people who are fleshly minded are always constantly consumed with thinking about things of the flesh. Always. And you're under a, you're under a, 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 a harness or a, 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 some type of a, a, com, a compulsion to fulfill and obey the lust of your flesh. You know what it's like. Don't sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, you know whenever you're trying to do good and you got an urge in you. Amen. You know what it's like. Yeah. 
and all that is is the flesh. And you can choose not to walk in that way anymore Amen. if you got the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Oh, I, I, I'll, never, I'll never get over the transformation that was made in me. I, got, I told you all about my Columbia Record Date Club presidency. I know I have. I, you know, and how, how I, I loved my music, and, and when I got truly born again, I think I told you about how my favorite tape slid back out under, from underneath my seat one time, and I thought I had destroyed all my music and most of my wife's music, and, and there was my tape, and, and I remember when it slid out. Brother, I, you know, the, I'm telling you, I, the very thought that come in my mind when I saw that I used to like the Eagles, and I saw it, and it was the greatest hits, and I picked it. I was at the stoplight. I had stopped short, and I reached between my legs, and I picked it up, and I went, ooh, look what the Lord. All right. Yeah. <laughs> look what the Lord <laughs> saved for me. I thought I had burnt that. Look what the Lord saved me. He gave it. And I'll never forget, I was reaching toward the player, and I, and I felt, I, I, it, it wasn't like he stopped me. I felt it in my heart. I, I heard him speak into my soul, and he said, what are you doing? Just a couple of days ago, you set all that stuff on fire, and you claimed that I was number one. And now the very first time this thing slides out from underneath your seat, not only are you going to uh, turn to it and walk in it, you're going to blame it on me? Right. Amen. Come on. I, that's, the, that's the choice that believers that walk in the Spirit, you face it every single day. The truth of the matter is, you want to try to dull your senses by thinking, well, everybody, brother, buddy, you got to live in this world. You got No, you don't. You don't have to conform to the things of this world. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. transformed. Don't allow these things to suck you back in. You don't got to do that no more. You don't have to be who you used to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Friend, listen to me. That's the whole point of no condemnation. That's the whole subject of being born again. That's the reason we come here. I pray that's why you're here tonight. You want to be different. You're not coming saying, well, I'm going to try to do better, but when I get out of here, I'm going to go do the same old stuff. If you're doing that, you're wasting your time. The only hope you and I have is if there is a truth of what Jesus said and that we can perish in and of ourselves and rise again as brand new creatures with a new heart and a new mind and a new direction through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I talked with Richard just a little while today out down on the, underneath the portico, and he said, brother, he said, you used to beat me up all the time. He said, now whenever you say you know what you got, he said, I know what you got too. He said, because I got the same thing. Amen. Hallelujah. And when I speak these truths, those that got it, they know, they understand. And for those of you that don't have it, I want to challenge your doubting minds to the fact that there was only one way that I could be rescued. I stand before you a liar and a cheater and a hypocrite rescued by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that remarkable? I don't know anybody else. I'm not talking about I'm just doing better and I'm in reform. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a recovering liar, cheater, mess upper. I've been transformed. I've been changed. I'm not the same man that I was. Brother Shannon Shelby yesterday, last night at the gospel scene, said something that struck me deep. Shannon said this. He said, if you want to find out if I'm a good singer or not, come hear me sing. If you want to find out if I'm a good preacher, come hear me preach. If you want to find out if I'm a good Christian, go ask my wife. Right. Can you imagine? 
Because people that know you the closest and the best can tell if there's been a real change in you or not. And you know, you know yourself whether you've been transformed or whether you just on the platform. I, I left off somewhere around verse 5. It says that they, they, they that are after the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. They are in obedience. They set their affection on things of the flesh. Now, you know, the people who claim to be Christians and are still seeking, actively seeking after things of this world, there's a problem with you. There's a problem with you. No change means no change. But they that are after the Spirit, they're now seeking after the things of the Spirit. When this, and there needs to be some transformation going on. Verse number 6 says, For to be carnally minded, carnally is another word for the fleshly minded, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In other words, if you're going to continue to chase after things of this world like you used to before you said you got saved, the end of your uh, existence is going to be destruction. It's going to be damnation. That's all that this world and this life, this carnality can produce for you is emptiness. It's void. And it ends in eternal damnation. I'm trying to tell you about a way towards what the end of this verse says, how to get to a life of peace. And it's by following after the mind of the Spirit of God. It's hearing God speak to your soul and directing you in a new path. Those, that's for every single individual that's ever been born again. You say, well, brother, buddy, I don't know. I think that's for the preachers and the deacons and the Sunday school teachers. I'm telling you, it's for the believer. Amen. It's for every individual who will place his trust in Jesus Christ. There is no respect of persons with him. No big eyes and little U's. He's working in your life, and you may not even recognize it or want to acknowledge it, but he's doing it right now tonight. By the receiving of this message, just in your hearing, you're receiving tonight the goods that you need to be transformed. In fact, I'm probably saying some things that are either uh, they're affecting you one way or the other. Either they're making you mad or they're causing you to be very, very uh, excited about the fact that you're going to make the transformation that we're talking about. Uh, one, one, or, one or two things. For to be carnally minded is death, spiritually minded life and peace. Verse 7 says, why? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Our carnal mind, the reason that it's an enemy of God is because anything that you think of is always self-serving. There's always a motive in it about how you can benefit if you come up with it. I know you think, you, listen, look, you know how it is that, um, that folks are asking all the time for donations to, whether it's to St. Jude or um, the Shriners Hospital or to feed the hungry children or, I mean, there's thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of charities all over the place that you can give to. And you know what they always do. They always entice you with some type of a gift and or your uh, tax tax-free um, tax break uh, you know, on, at the end of the year because you give a certain amount of money. It'll actually benefit you uh, towards your taxes, that type of stuff. So every time that these folks are given, which really looks good, it's really nice, and I'm glad they do, by the way, but the problem is, is in their doing it, they're doing it because they're expecting a return. I'll do it if I can. If I can. If I can get credit for it, so I can get uh, uh, you know my money knocked off on my taxes. I'll, I'll do it if if you'll have my name put up on a plaque. Man, we used to even do the same thing. I remember when we bought pews in the old church. My dad, he said, "Look, we'll we'll put your name. We got little tags about this big. We'll put your name on the end of the pew." And so, man, people, you know that people thought they owned that pew. Yeah. That's my hand to the Lord. That's my pew. That's exactly. We had folks ask somebody to move. <laughs> You're sitting on my pew. Say so right here. But they would donate and give if they could get something back. The, 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 the greatest gift they ever done was motivated by self-centeredness. Yeah. 
That's what carnality is. When it says that the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's just saying that everything that you do as a natural born human is not capable of understanding the kind of love that God has where He gives without expectation of return. Don't you know that God loves you regardless of whether you ever love Him back or not? That's right. That nothing you ever do will ever change God's love for you. We call that the agape love. It's the idea that God's love is absolutely unconditional. And you and I don't know how to love like that. The carnal mind is enmity with God, uh, against God before, before it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, because we are carnal. And the carnality of us is against God. Don't you understand and see, look, when you look at uh, verse number 7, the thought that come into my mind, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you guys remember this, and He went away a little distance from the disciples, maybe a stone's throw, the Bible says, so He could pray. Remember, he left them. He left some here. He took three more a little bit further. He said, you guys stay here and watch and pray. And he went a little further and he began to pray. And the Bible says to us in Jesus' prayer that he was asking the Father if this cup might pass from him. Remember, three times he did this. And then at the end of his prayer, he said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Do you see the carnality versus the spiritual right there? He says, don't let what I want be the way that these things go. I want your will to be done. I don't want the carnal to get involved. Because the carnality of man cannot do the will of God. Listen carefully. You cannot determine in your own mind to be a good Christian. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. You can't determine that you're going to walk according to God's laws and God's love. You can't do it, not in the carnality of your own mind. You can't make that determination in your own thinking. The only way you're going to do this is if you say to him, not in my will, but thy will be done. I don't want my way anymore. I've gone my way, and it ends up in a train wreck. Amen. I don't want to go my way anymore. I want to go the way that you would have me to go, Lord. Help me to humble myself before you so that I can follow in your footsteps. That's what he's asking for. This subject of no condemnation produces people that have been set free from the burden of having to be forced into servitude in order to deserve righteousness. Trying to wrap up. Verse 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. You just can't do it. <laughs> right. and, and it. And it ends up in absolute utter failure every single time, Mike. And because I'm, t listen, the idea is the best you can do is the best that you know that you can do. And all you know is what you know. And all that you know is corrupted because you're carnal in your thinking. You just don't have the ability. Oh, we think that we love. I remember uh, my daddy told me a long time ago, he said, I used to think that I loved you and your mama. He said, but I found out when I come to know the Lord, he said, I didn't even know how to love. I didn't even know what real love was. Mm. Well, the way most of us love is I'll love you as long as you please me. If not, we'll see you in court. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know? Uh, and we'll share the kids in the, in the motorcycle. Uh, the, the, the issue of, of, the, of, the, of life comes down to the, um, that we are in the flesh, and there is no way, there's no way that in the flesh that we can please God. Listen, it doesn't matter how good an individual somebody is, morally, speaking, without the Spirit of God dwelling in them, they cannot please God. It's just not possible. There's only one way that you can have this no condemnation, and I'm wrapping up. 
There's only one way. You must be born again. You have to have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Our very best that we do, the very best that we do is still ours. It's still us. It's still us trying to present our own. Do you remember a guy named Cain yep. who brought his offerings to the Lord? Yep. <laughs> remember, uh, these boys were taught that there needs to be a blood sacrifice. And, and Cain said, that's an old school man. Where you been? I go to that new church. We got smoke, mirrors, and things on the walls. And let me tell you how we do it there. We just come and we just fancy it up, dude. I'm telling you. So he come in with all the best of his crops. Man, I, if, he, if he was burning onions on that fire, I'm sure it smelled good because I love onions. Whatever he had placed into that fire, I'm sure it was a good smell to him. Probably smelled much better than the burning flesh that Abel had. The blood that was dripping. The nastiness, disgustingness of the sacrifice that had to be made for Cain, for Abel's, I'm sorry, a sacrifice. I, I can't imagine what that was like. And here Cain's going like, man, I'm, I'm sick of that stuff. I, I'm going to do it over here. This is more pleasing. And he offered that up to God. Do you remember what the Bible said? The Bible says that God had no respect for Cain's offering. He rejected it flat out. We don't know how he made that known, but it made, he made it known. Cain knew it and Abel knew it. <laughs> and he respected Abel. He had respect unto Abel's offering because it was blood sacrificed with flesh. But unto Cain's offering, it was rejected. And you remember how righteous a man Cain was. He was a good man. He thought, man, he was looked good on the outside and he worked hard and he come bringing all of his gifts, probably more stuff on his altar than Abel had, and he piled it up big going like, ah, brother, you ought to be like me. And when he, he set it on fire and God rejected him, he showed his true colors by getting angry at his brother who had done no wrong. Mm. Look at Cain and you think about him. He was trying to go his own way and it looked okay. But it was the way of carnality. It was what Cain thought it should be, not what God the Spirit says it should be. And he went the way he wanted to go. You know the end of the story. It ended up with Cain killing his brother and hiding his body, concealing the crime. And then God called up with him and said, what have you done? Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? Do you see the attitude? Do you see there's no change? Do you see that he is just as fleshly as he's ever been? while he's attending church and giving sacrifices, while he's pretending to be more righteous than his own brother, and the moment that God says that's not right, he gets angry, kills his brother, and blames God. Oh, my goodness. This world is roaming about with people who won't set foot back in a church because today they blame God. Because they chose to go their own way and it didn't turn out right. And they said, well, I tried that. God wasn't there. God don't work for me. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. The very best you do, it's still you, and therefore it is corrupt. Last verse, 9. Paul goes on to say, but you... If you're born again, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you've been born again and you've been dwelt with the Spirit of God, you are in the Spirit. Listen to me carefully. He's not talking about born again people living two separate lives. In this verse, he clarifies it very clearly and says, you are in the Spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you've been saved and God has deposited the Spirit, He's in you, and you are spiritual. 
You are, you are transformed not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. I told you this morning, I am not the same, and it ain't nothing that I've done. It's everything that he's done. And if you've been changed, it's not because you made up your mind you were going to be different. It's because God the Holy Ghost changed you. You're different because of Him. Hallelujah. And if you're not different because of Him, hold on, you're not different. You're still the same just wearing a mask. And you'll get mad when that mask gets jerked off and God refuses you. And you'll stomp out killing all the brothers you can on the way out and blaming God. At the same time, who I wish I could preach. I'd preach. Don't you see it? This is not a benign separation. When I say benign, this, this is not something that we can just deal with lightly. There is a very distinct line between saved and lost. There's a very distinct line. You can't walk the line. You can't straddle the fence. You can't be halfway in one and halfway in the other. There is a very big distinction because you are not your own anymore. You've been bought with the price. I call this the transformation. It's the change that's been made in you that you had nothing to do with. The only thing that you did to be transformed was you surrendered. When you gave up and you gave it to God and you said, here I am, send me. You let God choose you, break you, make you, and mold you into who you are today. You've been transformed. I'm not here to try to teach you how to be a Christian. I'm here to convince you that if you get born again, you'll be a Christian. And the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you into all righteousness. Scripturally speaking, He will. I hear a whole lot about, and I'm coming down here. I don't know, Rick, uh, play a song, maybe Adrian on the piano, I don't mind. Read the one. Just play me some music. I hear all the time about discipleship programs, and I believe that we should have some type of training, the idea that we need to, uh, but what I, what I find in discipleship programs sometimes is people are actually being taught how to have self-transformation. That's what I see so many times that happens. Uh, do you do this and live like this and do that? Check the boxes. You know, make sure you have your prayer time, your Bible reading time, and you know, this time do something good for somebody. You know, and uh, do, do all the check the boxes things, and and those are sweet and wonderful and smell good and all that type of stuff. But but any carnal person can do that kind of stuff. What I'd like to see is something happen in you and me that I can't do. I'd like to see a transformation in me that is undeniably God because I can't do it. I don't mean to pick on you, but I know how rotten you was. I'm just, I'm, and you're right here available for me. This guy was rotten. I'm telling you, he was despicably rotten. Chris cared about nobody in his life greater than he cared about himself. And that's the absolute truth. He's ruined, don't get mad at me, please. This, this young man, he's told me this same thus how can, he has ruined more lives in his lifetime because of his self-centeredness, because of the sin that was in his life. Even after he come to church and made professions, th there was no transformation, not really. Chris was dressing it up on the outside, baby. He was slathering it on, you know, wax on, wax off. He was putting it on thick. But man, he's, he was still rotten. You could smell it. And then one day, Jesus, Jesus grabbed a hold of this man and he broke him. I got chills running around, running circles on my back and brought him to a place of restoration done something in him that he couldn't do in him. 
was so obvious to me. My wife and I talk about that all the time. We've seen such a tremendous, beautiful. I talked to Richard, your lifelong friend. He told me the same thing. Listen, I, I'm, not just, I'm not boasting Chris because Chris tried it and Chris couldn't do it. All Chris did was give God a bunch of broken stuff in his life. And God made it brand new for him. It ain't what Chris done. It's what Jesus, he done the same thing with me. My question is, has he done the same thing with you? That's the thing. And I, I bring this out because I, I want you to hear me today. There needs to be a transformation in you that can't be done by you. It has to be something. And if that's never happened for you, I want to encourage you tonight. And I want to encourage you tonight that you come and let that trans. He wants to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And that's give yourself a brand new life. Would you come? The altars are open already. I know I hadn't really, I, I hadn't really violated.